All right, Jeffrey, welcome to the show. So the last weekend I sat down to read the novel that you wrote recently, Furious Sailing into Terror, and uh, I did not get up until I finished the novel. And I'll let you maybe later on uh, describe it. I don't want to give away any spoilers that you're not comfortable getting away. The best way I can describe it is it was like watching a movie like Sleeping with the Enemy, if you remember that except that there's nowhere to run. It's all happening in a confined space. But there's also a real depth to it, which I found interesting. So I have my novel coming out, and what I've always wanted to do was take the kind of depth and solid writing that you get from 19th century romanticism, but have the pacing and ease of consumption of a modern thriller. And I feel like you did something very similar to that. So I'm really excited to talk to you about the book and about how you came to write it. Well, thanks for having me, Don. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. Uh, there, there's a lot in that statement you just made, right? You know, certainly the, the closed setting of a novel uh, amps up the, the danger and limits the writing in a lot of ways. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the, uh, underlying kind of themes in the book. And I, I think that's what really draws people to writing, you know, like, like in romanticism and the hero's journey. And, you know, it's, I think people, even if they don't specifically articulate what a theme is or something they like in a book, I think subconsciously they get it. They understand the, the underlying story beyond the, the action in the plot. Yeah. Because the, I mean, the, the, it can be fun to watch somebody like run away from danger, but if they have to conquer something internal, there's something that sticks with you about that in a way where it's, you know, I might not have to run away from a madman or swim away from a shark, but there are things that I need to overcome or things that I want to achieve. And if you are able to integrate those two things, like that makes, I think, a story really memorable. Yeah, you definitely need both parts of it. And, you know, in the writing community, there is there's always this debate about character versus plot and, you know, well, and, and the importance of each. And the, the short answer is they're both really important. You know, every every story that that readers love generally has memorable characters and they're memorable because there's some kind of internal conflict that they're dealing with, as well as whatever the external conflict of the, of the that's driving the plot. So, you know, characters generally need to have some change from the beginning to an end of a book. They have to deal with things. Some, sometimes it's a difference between their wants and their needs. You know, they they think they want a certain thing and that's what's driving maybe the external uh, conflict. But really what they need is something internal that, that needs a change or a better understanding of something. So I, I think, you know, this you, you have to have both of those to have a good story. And the, the external plot, right, the 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 being 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 chased by bad guys or chasing bad guys or whatever that may be is is a fun way to you know to to keep a reader turning pages but it's it's the the internal things that are happening to the character that allows the reader to directly relate to them and also to to touch on ideas that that they may that readers may have but not know they have <laughs> you know some sometimes it's internal philosophy and in, in what in in you know how you approach life and what's your epistemology and the, these sort of deeper issues people don't spend a lot of time outside of like philosophical circles talking about that but they sense it and there i think there are these there's there's some truths in life that are objective and you know natural laws that that i believe everybody it resonates with people and they understand that it could be true or that it is true. And that's what draws people to a story. Like I, I, I've had people, some of my writing people have called literary, which is nice, but a lot of literary fiction is, is our stories without a plot, you know, and, and, and often it's, it's all about the character development. And, and while that's interesting, I, I think you need, you need more than that. You know, you, you, you need, you need to have a point to what it, whatever it is you're doing. And when, you hear a log line for a book, you know, like what's, what, what's the plot about in one or two sentences. And when you hear that um, people are drawn to it, like, gee, that's an interesting idea. And the idea itself, you know, can, can be the plot, but then it has to have a uh, much deeper ideas behind it for it to be interesting. Cause you, you can't care about a character if, if the character is, is um, two dimensional, right. You can't care about a character if they don't have qualities or virtues that, that you agree with. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a highly unlikable character, there has to be that, like they call it the save the cat moment. There has to be some moment where there's something redeemable about that person's character that even if they're a curmudge or curmudgeon or, or even if they're doing bad things, you still want to root for them because you know you have, they have some goodness deep within them. Yes, I want to come back to stories in general and to your book in general. But um, 
before I read your book, I read your author bio. And <laughs> the first thing I wanted to do is like just bow my head in shame because my author bio will never live up to it. But how did you come <laughs> to write a novel? So tell me a little bit about sort of, you know, how you got to this place in your journey. Well, you know, I've always considered myself a writer and, I, you know, I'm in critique groups and I have a lot of writer friends. And I think most of them, it's, it's rare that somebody comes to writing much later in life. I think, you know, people love stories. Stories are how we communicate information to each other. Stories are how cultures change and are continued and things. So, you know, it's a, it's a deep part of, of how human beings you know interact with the world. And ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to be a writer. Like I was, I was an only child for my first seven years of my life. And, you know, I was a voracious reader. And I remember just the, the excitement I'd get, that warm feeling I'd get when I'd open up a book and start a, start a story, you know, that would take me into another world. So I've always, I've always been a huge reader. I've always been a writer. I was writing stories and, in, in, you know, these uh, drawing covers with crayons when I was like six years old. <laughs> you know? So it's been part of me my whole life. And I started as a, a reporter. Because, you know, everyone told me you can't make money writing books, which turns out is kind of true. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very rare to be able to, to make a living at it. But um, well, that was you know, that, start- that had been my plan as well, because, what you know, to be a writer is a weird thing in the sense that it's not like, OK, here's the track to follow. You know, it's figure out a track to follow. And the closest you get to a track, or at least what I had in mind was was journalism, though I ended up not going that route. So you went into journalism. Where did you, uh, where did you start out? I had my undergraduate degree was in journalism from Boston university. And then I worked for a string of weekly and biweekly papers in Massachusetts. And then I was between jobs and I was waiting. I had a, a job opening they, at the Middlesex news, but they it wasn't going to be funded for like six months. And I saw, and I was taking, I, I took the time to, I took a motorcycle trip around the country. I've always tried to do some kind of adventurous or, you know, interesting things. And um, I saw a job uh, advertised for a private investigator. And I was a big Robert Parker fan, you know, the Spencer for, for oh, yeah. years. The you know, first, the first mystery book. novels that I fell in love with. Oh, they were fantastic. His voice was incredible. And as a matter of fact, the first thing I wrote back in like the, the 80s was in Robert Parker's voice. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was mimicking him. You know, you, so, you know, I, I, I did saw the that. same like, exact thing. <laughs> same exact thing. That's funny. Isn't it funny how like, you know, these, these, these authors who are so good in, in his character, right? His stories are good and they're interesting, but the, the Robert Parker's books, and I haven't read them in 20 years, but the, you know, they're, they're about uh, morality in a, in a character, a heroic character who uses his own reason to determine, you know, what's right. And it goes against laws and the police are often after him. And he's, 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 you know, making deals with bad guys to, to, to achieve like a, a moral end. And so, you know, that that's a great character. And Robert Parker's voice was just terrific. Terrific. He was funny and sarcastic. And so I saw this job as a private investigator. And I'm like, oh, what, you know, what great fodder for books. And I got into it. And while I was waiting for this, I, I did a couple private investigator jobs. And while I was doing that, I was exposed to a lot of people who whose life dream had been law enforcement. So I kind of got into it. And I was reading a lot of books about law enforcement. I was like, you know, this, this could be interesting. And but I was really, you know, thinking what 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 a great way to have some life experience for my writing. And I became a, a police officer in Florida. And then I, I ended up going to the DEA, which is ironic because I've always believed in the legalization of most drugs. You know, so I've always been a fairly libertarian uh, politically. Um, but so I, but so I spent my whole career like you know going after international uh, hit crews, and I, I always focused on the violence. You know, the last fifteen years of my career were almost exclusively uh, doing counterterrorism work. And it, because I, again, I do believe that we should just legalize most drugs. I don't believe in these paternalistic laws, but, you know, but, but the people who are doing these horrific violent crimes definitely need to be stopped, you know? So I, I, I kind of, I fell in love with the actual mission and the people who are generally who are in law enforcement are, are just wonderful people who want to make their communities better and, and are fighting for something they believe in. And so it was, it was sort of, sort of an intoxicating, exciting culture. I was, I was all over the world. I was in, you know, 50 plus countries and, you know, chasing, chasing high value targets terrorists around the world for a long time so it was it was an exciting career and i was really lucky to have it but i've always thought of myself as a writer you know if you ask me what i did i would tell you oh i'm a i'm a, I'm a special agent but if if you, you know if you ask me who you know who i am i'm a writer so after many many years i finally got back to it and you know as because i work for the federal government i couldn't publish without their permission and everything had to be vetted through them so I, I i really didn't write much i wrote a little here and there i didn't try to publish anything and then i retired in 2017 i've been writing full time since then well when you were in your work in law enforcement 
what was there anything that you found particularly surprising that you didn't expect to encounter? You know, the, the I guess the whole uh, the whole vocation was surprising to me. You know, like it was something I'd never thought about. But when I was a reporter, I did I covered a lot on the police beat. You know, and so I, I spent time talking to, to cops, and I was I was I was involved. You know, interested in their cases. And I remember we had we had a. Uh, we had a, a case, uh, Daniel LaPlante, who'd, who'd murdered this family in this little sleepy town outside of Boston near where I lived. And we were covering that. And I remember being in the chain of police cars, following them when they were chasing him. He was a fugitive for several days. And, you know, it was just, it was just exciting. Like the whole the, the idea of it to me was, I guess, a more of a romantic idea of what law enforcement is. But, you know, it's, it's certainly it's a, it's a way to pull back the window on humanity and, you know, what how people act in the real world. You know, there are these ideas when you're in law enforcement, you sort of see people at their worst. You know, that's sort of what the job is. You go into people's homes at the worst moment in their life, you know, when there's death and violent crime and things, that's when you show up. So it's a, it's a way to really help people. And, you know, you get all types of law enforcement. There's a small minority of people in law enforcement who like to lord power over others. You know, you kind of get that personality. There's probably a a percentage of them that are sociopaths who go into that for, for that reason. But the, the vast majority of people that I met in law enforcement got into it because they wanted to help people. You know, they really want, they, they, they saw injustice or they saw people being hurt, people weaker than themselves and wanted to stand up for those people. And I mean, there, it's, a, it's a really good community when you're inside it. And obviously now is a, a very difficult time to be a law enforcement officer in this country. And there's certainly things in reform and, and there's abuses of power. I, again, I'm libertarian, right? So, you know, the, the power of the state is something we all need to be on guard for all the time. And it's so out of control right now. But the actual police officers and the people who are out there on the street are doing an absolute necessary job. And, uh, and, and, and most of them are just really good people. As a reader... What most what what uh what things most drive you crazy that authors will get wrong when they're dealing with law enforcement? You know, it's funny because you know, so I love stories. So you know, even I'm 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 probably the most forgiving reader ever. When when I hear when I read something that I know is not right, I'm like, okay, and I gl I gloss over it. If it happens too much, then it takes me out of it. You know, and I can't suspend uh, my disbelief. But it you know you so but I, I'm happy that that authors are writing about like these exciting things, especially I, I write thrillers, right? So I, it's exciting to have people writing these th thrillers and, but they, people have, who have no real firsthand knowledge of that world, right? Like the, the real evil that exists in human beings and in the, the unbelievable violence they're willing to visit on their neighbors. And, you know, if you don't really understand that and haven't been there, it's hard to write it authentically. And I think the, you know, people like Michael Connolly, the Harry Bosch series, you know, they've, they, they he, he was a reporter and he spent, he spent a lot of time, you know, talking to police officers. So you can, you, it just comes through, right? When you read it, it's yeah. so little details, you go, wow, this is authentic and I get it. So when, when I read stuff, I mean, it's all the time. It's like, you know, it's, it's the, the basic stuff, like with firearms that people always get wrong. It's the, you know, the venues that, you know, like, oh, they, they have the CIA doing domestic things, which they'd never be involved with. They have, you know, agents running off and doing things that they could, would never be allowed to do. Like there, there's all that kind of stuff. But I think I think the worst of it, the stuff that really takes me out of it is the violent encounters. You know, I've, I've been I've been shot at and mortared and rocketed and I wrestled a suicide bomber, you know, and I've I've been in I've been in hundreds of violent confrontations over, you know, 25 years that I was in law enforcement. And so, you know, I know what it feels like and, and I, I know what I know the emotions and I know how that works. And a violent encounter that you see that a couple Hollywood producers put together or direct or set up, you know, on the big screen often has nothing to do with what an actual violent encounter looks like. So a lot of writers get what they think would happen through television. And that's, that's often very wrong. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's, it's very rare that it's kind of factual information that brings me out of a story, but it's more when kind of dialogue, you just think this is not how it, it's more to the point you're making about the emotions and the experience of things. It's, this is never how people talk. This is not how, people react and it's it's kind of the 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 more psychological um, way of losing touch with reality that i find okay i can't move forward this and so usually you can tell within the first kind of pieces of dialogue in a story if the author actually like seems to remotely understand human beings and that that's usually when i'll give up on something is the first 10 pages if i feel like no this is a person telling a story because they've heard characters talk in other stories and like they're they're trying to mimic that 
And uh, I mean, that's that's definitely my number one test and the thing I'm most afraid of ever, you know, falling victim to in my own writing. Yeah, I mean, that. well, that's the benefit of critique groups and having beta readers, right? So honest writers can, honest, can, can tell you, this is terrible, you need to fix this, or this is, you know, this is rigid language or something. Now, I agree with you, I, you know, especially like, I, I was just reading a, th- a, a very famous thriller writer who wrote a book, and, and I won't name them because I got to tell you, since I've started writing, the last thing I'll ever do is really criticize another writer. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it seems like it's kind of the writer against everybody, right? You're so, you're so alone when you're doing this stuff. And there, and there, there is such a, there's so many predatory uh, businesses that come up that target writers. And it's so hard to work with publishers and agents and then the, then the critics. And, you know, so the, the last thing I'm going to do is criticize another author, but I'll, without telling you who they are, you know, I, I guess it, they had their character just jumping from, from crazy scene to crazy scene, which is fun. Right. I mean, and we, we can all suspend our disbelief for a thriller because we know what, what the author's doing a little bit, but the, the emo- what you're talking about, the emotional reactions to these life and death things were just missing completely, you know? So they, they, the author would go through the scene in a few pages that, you know, really you should drag out for a long time because it's such an, it's such a consequential scene with like shooting and people dying and all this. You can't just, but sort of glossing over it with absolutely like no emotional residue afterwards. And, you know, I've, I've been in, I've been in shootings and, you know, I've, I've been in a lot of uh, really horrible scenes in every now and then you, you have police officers level, you know, sense of bravado. It's a defense mechanism that they, they don't, you know, they're not going to sit there and weep over a body because you can't and, and do your job at the same time, but it does affect you. And if you, and if you are at, if you're, if you're given the James Bond movie lines while you're doing it, you're doing it out of bravado and you're doing it as a defense mechanism and as a way to not address the underlying feelings because you can't. And so, and, but if people who are, who are, have their characters who just, it does, things don't bother them at all, or they're, they're not understanding the import of what just happened. That's not a human emotion. I mean, you know, special agents are, 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 are humans <laughs> and, you, and you can't help it. And the, the more you're involved in something violent, like I've been in shootings where my pulse went up a little bit, but not much, you know, like the more you, the more you're involved in, in violence, the more normal it becomes and the more your training kicks in, right? If, if somebody, if somebody's, if you're, if, if you're a plumber and you're driving to work one day and you get into a fender better and suddenly somebody's attacking you, the chance of you go, going into the black, they call it, right? Where you, you're just not thinking rationally. You don't know what's happening. Kind of having a shot. People literally get frozen sometimes when they're faced with, with mortal danger. And, but the more that happens and training certainly helps you, you, you learn to understand what's coming and you learn how to control your own emotions and you learn how to, so, you know, I, I got to a point where I, I, I was in so many encounters that I could be in a shooting and still be excited about what was happening and understand that the life and death stakes, but, but not lose my head at all, you know, but I, I would never write it. Like, especially from the internal, you know, emotions of the person involved in the shooting that what, what was going on wasn't you know really important and their life could literally be over in the, in the, in the blink of an eye. Yeah. And I mean, I can think of, you know, there's books like, I mean, Ian Fleming's books where it's deliberately, you're kind of um, abstracting away from the kind of visceral reality of what, you know, a character like Bond is doing. But it's, it's different than, I'm trying to put my finger on it, but it's different than somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing. And that they'll be kind of like on the nose emotions. And um. I'll have to think about how to name the distinction, but right either there is a difference between an author who's kind of uh, creating a different kind of story rather than one that's viscerally real versus somebody who is kind of like engaging in cookie cutter kind of pat writing that is unknowingly alienating from the human experience. No, I think that's exactly right. And I mean, you can see it in other areas of writing too, where you have to know what the rules are to break them. But if you're breaking them because you don't know what the rules are, you're not breaking them purposefully. So you're just breaking them because you're not writing well. You know, and, and like with the Ian Fleming books, I haven't read those since I was a kid, but I mean, my memory of them was that they were more realistic. Like they, like the Ian Fleming had hardened the character based on, you know, personal loss that he'd suffered and, and, you know, and understand, and he, he did get injured and he did get captured and like those things types of things happen it was very different than the you know roger moore movies that your sean right. connery movies that you later saw yeah so you retire from law enforcement you said in 2017 and 
at what point did you get the idea for this book? So I started by writing a nonfiction book, which my agent actually has now. And is, I think she's just about to start the submission process about the first narco-terrorism case that, I, that was my case that I was involved with in Afghanistan. It's kind of, it kind of goes from 9-11. I was, I was responded to 9-11. I was one of the first people to get to the tower, North Tower, when it came down. And then pushing my agency into narco-terrorism, try, trying to use our investigative skills because we, we really did some of those law enforcement techniques that we use for going after like international criminal organizations and organized crime translates perfectly into going after these sort of amorphous terrorist organizations, you know, with, with independent cells and things. So I, I, I pushed my agency into it and then ended up uh, making the first arrest for the new narco-terrorism law in, in, in bringing this terrorist to, uh, to justice. So that was my first book. And then I just needed, I, I, I started a, a, a crime book, which is actually coming out this August. It's called Unseen. <laughs> and it, it's, 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 I think it's, I think it's a fun book and it's, it's coming out in a couple months in August. And, um, and then I, I went right into this because I just needed to get away from anything dealing with law enforcement. I wanted to write something that was so different from what my personal experience was, you know, that I, that I could let myself escape and, and flex my muscles as a new writer a little bit. So I, I, I had this idea. I was, I was, you know, I spent a lot of time in the developing world and, you know, people, you hear it all the time in the media. Now people are always complaining about capitalism, right? And they're complaining about the United States and sure we have our problems and things, but no one's ever been in a better place in time. You know I mean? The, the, the things we take for granted and the ability to just be safe in our homes is, is unprecedented really in human history. You know, the, the, to, to be alive in this time and with the technology that we have and the, the amount of safety we have is just incredible. So I was thinking, you know, how fragile it all really is, like how fragile is society? And, you know, like we saw, we almost saw this during the pandemic, right? With the, when the supply lines were within a couple of weeks of collapsing, had they collapsed, what would happen? So Two years before the pandemic, because I, I think it was the fall of, or the spring of 2018, this is what I was thinking about. And so I, I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm right outside of Washington, D.C. And what would happen? I had like a pandemic story, which, of course, will never see the light of day. Now I've written it, but I don't even want to read it. You know, yeah. <laughs> It's not escapism for anybody. But I'd written this thing. What would happen if it was this, this pandemic with this horrible disease? And how, what would be the best way to escape? And I was thinking, I'm a sailor. So I was like, oh get on a boat. What, what great way to get away from people than to be on a boat. And then you'd take your neighbors with you if you could. And, but then what if one of them was dangerous, right? What if one of them had a problem and you were on this boat? So I started thinking about the closed setting. And so that was sort of the germ of the idea. And, and I ended up uh, 90% of Furious takes place on a 62 foot uh, Benetau Oceanus yacht, which is a gorgeous boat, by the way. <laughs> well, that's the first thing I did when I, uh, because I, I, so I've tried to read, um, or not tried to, you know, I, a lot of like romanticist literature, some stuff by Hugo and others, it's very boat centric, ship centric. And I find it very hard to like mentally picture what they're talking about. So like the first thing that I did was, you know, you gave us a specific boat and went and looked up pictures and everything and really tried <laughs> to get, okay, yeah, I, I can. I, and as soon as I saw it, I was like, man, that sounds big. And compared to, you know, anything that I've, uh, like little motorboats I've been on. It is huge. But how are you going to maintain a whole story in what is a relatively small space? I was I was very dubious that you could sustain that for, you know, several hundred pages. Yeah, that was the challenge, right? A closed setting book is incredibly difficult. And in this case, there's really there's two people on the boat. And much of much of the time, it's it's the internal thoughts and the actions of one person, right? So it's a character. So that's 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 incredibly difficult to to keep it, you know, to to get to get away from exposition or to get a, to keep it exciting for the reader. And the other challenge was a female character, you know. So th those two things for like my my debut novel, I think, were were a little challenging. But I'm I'm glad I did them. I mean, I, th I think it worked, and I'm I'm certainly getting good feedback on it. Well, I was, I mean, I, I have a first person female character in my novel and, uh, and it is a challenge, but part of what I was impressed with. So part of the setup for this is it's a, it's a woman who's getting over the loss of her baby, um, a, an infant. And part of what I was very struck by, and this goes to what we were speaking about earlier about something being emotionally real is I, I had a friend who whom lost a who lost a baby I, I think uh four months old something around there and i think you really got the exactly the kind of thinking and emotional state that a person goes through 
and and that was very impressive to me because that's that's such a um it's such an unusual like thankfully a, it, you know a state that's remote from most people's lives um they haven't gone through it they haven't experienced it and uh i, I was just in awe of like okay that that if if he can bring me inside this woman's mind and really create an experience that resonates here i feel like okay i'm in good hands whatever else comes after this well thank you i love hearing that and i love your comments like you said at the opening like you you read it in one night those i think are the best compliments you can get as a writer that, that somebody loses himself in the book and doesn't want to put it down um yeah i was i was trying to get to the uh to the you know in, inside a person's head and, yet, and it has to be authentic right if you if you're reading something that you can tell just as, as a writer making up stories, it's it, people, it just won't hold the reader's attention, you know? So I, hopefully I did that throughout the book. I, I actually had a lot of underlying philosophy and, and themes that go through this book that were the reason I wrote it, you know, like that it's, it's fun to write a thriller, but people learn through story. And I, I just, I wanted to be able to tell a story that kept your attention, but I wanted these underlying themes to, to, to be understood by the reader, even if they didn't do it consciously. Like, I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand what's behind it, but one, but it's satisfying because of what's behind it. You know, so these ideas, like my, my, my character at the beginning, she's, she's so depressed. She was on the verge of becoming a pediatric surgeon, which was her lifelong dream. She'd always been focused on her career and she had this uh, unexpected pres uh, pregnancy and a rapid marriage. And so you get her after her child dies, uh, you know, from SIDS. And then it's, she's questioning what is life if a child can be taken from her like that and she can't break out of the depression and she's, you know, her, her hospital has her see a psychiatrist and that's not helping. And, you know, and so it's, it sort of comes up, you know, what, where, where is her agency and how can she break out of this? And so the whole book is her through a series of trials when she's on this boat coming to grips with what her life is and ha has she been on the right path, both with her husband and with her career, you know, what, what, what does it mean? What should you, what is life about and what you, what you, what should you be doing with your, with your life? And then also to what extent is an individual capable of shaping their outcomes? You know, so it's, it's really a book about having agency in your own life and, and being able to take charge of your life, both internally and externally and fighting for the things you believe in. Yeah, I mean, the way that I thought about it, so I, I, forgive me if I get this wrong and maybe you could correct me. The first line of the book is something like, I wanted to die. And it's really exploring. So my my favorite author is Ayn Rand and she's very interested in what you can think of as spiritual survival, which is how do you achieve the willingness and the desire to live your life, to go on you know, taking actions and set goals and pursue your happiness because she doesn't think that we automatically have that. It's something we have to, in effect, we, we usually have it naturally in childhood, but it has to be maintained um, by the way you live your life or you can you know, lose any desire to make anything of your life. It doesn't always mean suicide, but it's the way that you know, people kind of waste their lives not being purposeful, not setting demanding goals, just kind of going with the flow. And that your character is kind of facing the worst version of that, where it's um, it the question's kind of staring her in the face of like like is life worth living and can I live it and and then that's all you know put to the ultimate test in everything that follows. Yeah, that's exactly right. I'm glad you got that. I think I, that that's what I was trying to talk about. Right, those are the very ideas and this I, this idea of being able to, you know, figure out what's worth fighting for and to figure out what's worth living for. And then what, what is your role and why are you doing things? What are the motivations behind them? And are, are things good in and of themselves or where, you know, she's with a, she's with a man that she didn't even really want to date, but, but, you know, had a brief affair with him. And this child came from it. She's, she's in a job, which is dedicated to helping other people right? The sort of altruism that comes with, with the medical profession and what's good and bad about that, you know, that she sort of, that she deals with when, she, when she's on the boat. And then the very real visceral moment, like, which, you know, like I told you earlier, I've, ex I've experienced in my own life many times is, you know, this, your life could literally be over right now. So what you're doing, is it worth risking that? Is it, it in, in what will you do to get out of it? And, and how precious is life 
you know, are, 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 are you complaining because your Wi-Fi is bad in your house? And really, how, how, how disconnected is that from human existence? You know, and so these are I mean, uh, the way we're talking about this, it sounds like it's a very philosophical book, but it's sort of underneath the plot that's happening. Right. Which I which hopefully makes it a more fulfilling experience for the reader. But there are moments when she, she does articulate this and when she's thinking about these things and coming to that uh, internal resolution as, as the plot progresses. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, there's uh, I've encountered too many novels by uh, I think people with good intentions who they want to say something important and what they forget is to write a good story. <laughs> and right. I, I think you could a person could read your book and only kind of sense that there was deeper ideas in there and not feel like it's hit over the head. Um, but I wanted to bring it out because I think that's I mean, it's exactly what I'm trying to do, which is an, a, a thriller with depth. Like that's my favorite kind of writing um, in terms of what I like for entertainment purposes. I want to consume something that's just kind of a thrilling story, but there's something deep there's, you know, there's more going on there. And um, I think that's definitely true of your story. You know, Andrew Breitbart said that politics is downstream from culture. And I really believe that culture is the way to get ideas into the mainstream. And so, you know, by writing novels that, that, that do have something deeper to say in them, I think it's a way to get people to think about it. And it also also show like, you know, it, it, this book is romanticism in the fact that it's sort of a hero's journey, right? Sort of a reluctant hero, I guess, in someone who's who's fighting for specific things and, and fighting literally for survival and, you know, taking charge and, you know, life or death is up to her own actions. And, and, and is it worth fighting for? And if so, then what do you do and how far do you go? Right. And, and so you know, th those are really important ideas. And I, th I think especially in the culture right now, I, I think we're missing a lot of that. You know, they're, they're, we're in this whole victim culture right now where people feel like external forces direct their lives. And, you know, if you're if you're of a certain race or a certain class or you're born in a certain place, you know, you're, you're ho helpless in your life, which, of course, is not true. <laughs> you know, and so but if, if you don't I, I, like I was, I was thinking about this last night, as a matter of fact, I was, I was watching something on, on Hulu or Netflix and you know, it seems like all of the new stuff that's coming out, like almost, almost all of it, unless it's like a histor historical fiction, is, 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 I don't wanna, they're not anti-heroes, but they're heroes without virtue, right? So they're protagonists who are all so deeply broken in the way they view life, in their, their lack of reason, in their bad decision making, in their, their way they're driven by bad emotions, right? I mean, the, the whole, like across the board, the, I haven't seen a, like a, 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 something that's made in, say, the last five years where I, where I really was rooting for the character. It's like, it's like somehow being heroic or fighting for ideas is, is wrong, you know, or, or, or having a, a higher virtues that, that you're, that you're striving for or admiring in others or, or trying to, trying to uh, change in society. Like, like somehow that's corny, but if you're the, if you're the 38 year old uh, man trapped in a 15 year old's mind, you know, like, like somehow that's okay. It, if, if, if you, you know, they're all these kind of, everyone is having this like existential angst, you know, and it's, and it's, and I see it just sort of across what I'm getting, everything I'm getting in Hollywood. And I really think that has a long-term negative effect on society in general, because the people that, you know, children will emulate are people they see and, you know, we're seeing it across the culture, but especially in Hollywood and, and they're doing it purposely, right? They're, they're doing it to change the culture. And I know this because they've said it, <laughs> you know, the people who are running, they want to change the culture. So they're, 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 you're, you're just getting hammered day in and day out with this leftist ideology, which I believe is, is really is morally just horrible. And it's, 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 it's lacking any kind of redeeming quality. And, and some of it might sound good, but you're seeing it in these characters that are, you know, parents who are horrible parents to their children. And I just I, run, I, I can't find people to root for in these in these modern stories. Yeah. And I think part of it is thought of as uh, like. I mean, this is kind of not the most fundamental objection to it, but I do think it's a real issue that it's just easier. Right. Oh, I mean, all I have to do is come up with this kind of you know, crummy character uh, who has all of these problems. Whereas making a virtuous hero interesting and realistic and um, like that, I think is a real challenge. Whereas like, okay, yeah. I mean, obviously if you have somebody who's like, you know, hiding their serial killer, you know, part-time job, like that's inherently interesting in a certain way, right? 
Whereas if you're trying to like motivate us to be invested um, in a person who's genuine, gen, genuinely virtuous, I mean, there's a real art to doing that without it coming across as kind of pat and um, canned. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I also think it says more about the the writers than it than it does you know the the viewer. You know, so if in in both literature and on the big screen, I, I think people people who don't understand what it is brings happiness or long term happiness, you know, can't write about it. And if and if people who who really don't understand, like you know, you see it you see it on the political side, like in economic side, you know, people people com- complaining about a representative government, people complaining about uh, capitalism. You know, if, if they don't really understand the ideas, you can't understand what's good in them. And often you can't understand what the opposite is. And I think we're, we're falling at this society is falling into the same thing the Romans fell into. Right. It's, it's like kind of throughout history when things are really good. And when, when your civilization is sort of on the top, it's, it's really easy to forget what things would be like without it. And I think so you, you're, you're getting sort of this rich child syndrome that, that I think we have across our culture and people are genuinely unhappy. And it, it's, it just blows my mind how anyone can be unhappy when they have so much opportunity and when they, when they have so much safety and so, so much room to express themselves, you know, and, but we're, we're seeing that. And I think, I think our culture, the, the way the turn our culture has taken since Ayn Rand was writing about this stuff in the sixties, right. I think, I think that the, 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 the direction that we're headed, I think is, is, is what's the cause of this really it's at the root cause of this. And so I think, and I, and I think people know it. Like, I, I think, I think the idea is like, if you talk about freedom, people roll their eyes, right? <laughs> you know, but, but these are real ideas, you know, whether it's political or economic or whatever, as you're talking about, when you're talking about ideas like freedom, it's, it's an important concept and it's, it's a fairly new concept. It's, you know, you know, only talking the last few hundred years, people have really talked about individualism in that how you have like this natural right to exist and you have a natural right to pursue your own life. And th- th- these are very modern ideas. And so much good has come from it. The world's been transformed by these ideas, but people forget them. And so in all my writing, because this is what I I deeply believe this, right? So these are things I believe. I believe in free markets. You know, I believe in political freedom. I believe in free speech. I believe in these things very much. And and so it comes through in my characters. It comes through in all my characters, as a matter of fact. I also also believe in, in... in reason and logic. And I believe, you know, using your mind to decipher reality. And I've always felt like this. So that's, that's sort of a theme for my characters. I've actually had to go and like the book is coming out in August. Somebody had mentioned that the guy, because, because he's, he's, he's an economist and he's, you know, using reason and logic to decipher the things that happened to him. I I had to go and make him a little more fallible and a, a, a little more emotional. (laughs) <laughs> so, so, so people would relate to him a little better, but the idea behind it is that let's, let's, there are objective answers and let's search for them. What did you find most difficult in writing, uh, furious? I mean, it, it, it was harder for me to write a female protagonist. You know, I, I know a lot of really strong female women in my life. My, my wife, Cynthia Farahad is the strongest, bravest person I've ever met. I, I dedicated this book to her. She's the most courageous person. She grew up in Egypt under a socialist government and an Islamist government and was, was being spied on for, for 15 years where the government bugged her, her, her condo, where they were following her. She formed the first uh, pro-Western, pro-Israel, a secular political party in the history of Egypt. You know, and, and she was she was she was getting nightly death threats from Al Qaeda and from other Islamists and from the, the Muslim Brotherhood and and, and, you know, this, this, this young, as a young girl, all that she wanted to do was be a sculptor. She's a very talented artist, but the, in, under these socialist regimes, they don't want people to be happy. It's part of oppressing them. So they choose what, what people's fields of study are. So they want to send her to law school instead. And then the Islamists were just destroying what was once a really free uh, Egypt back in like the 1930s was an incredibly free place. And, you know, back in uh, between the twenties and the fifties, you know, they had one of the strongest economies in the world and, and, and this in socialism in, in, Islamic regime just crushed that. And so she, she dedicated, you know, her from, from her, I believe her early teens into her, through her twenties, just trying to understand what drove people and understand these issues and fight back against them so much so that the government was, was trying to kill her. They, they told her they were trying to assassinate her and, and fast forward, you know, 20 years of her fighting this, this horrible totalitarian system. And now just, just within the last month or so, 
they put her picture on the masthead of El Dastur, which is the, the most widely read paper in the Middle East. And she has, you know, she gets calls from ambassadors and ministers and they're asking for her input. And, they're, and she's, she's writing about John Locke and Adam Smith and, and columns that are going across the Middle East. And, she, and, and Egypt is transforming itself. It still has a lot of problems, but it's transforming itself. So, you know, I, I just, I mean, that, that's one of the most heroic journeys I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> a little girl in the most paternalistic society on earth dealing with that. And now she's having the people in the very government that was trying to kill her are reaching out to her, asking her her opinion on, on how on, you know, on what should happen. And she's, of course, she's she's a big uh, fan of objectivism and, and Ayn Rand as well. That's great. Well, there's there's another book there. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I would love to write her story. It's amazing. And I've, I've actually taken quite a few notes and I, I just, I would need her permission to write it, but it's, 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 it's one of the most amazing stories. I mean, she used to, she, as a sculptor, you know, under, under a uh, Sharia law, like it's, it's, it's uh, illegal to make false idols. Right. So she, she couldn't even sculpt like busts and, and, because of what she was doing, she would have to go out and use like building uh, materials, building clays with little chips in them. So her fingers would bleed and she, she had one of her assistants would go out and, and acquire these materials for her. And when people found out he was acquiring it so she could make sculpture, they broke his legs. You know, like what she had to do to just express herself was just amazing. And so this little girl who just wanted to go to art school and she's, she's ended up transforming the country, you know, for, for, for millions of people. And she, she gets, she gets uh, these, these unbelievable messages from like from, from Coptic Christians and from Muslims across the Middle East, thanking her for what she's doing for women's rights and for helping people in, in this, in the, what was an incredibly restrictive society. And so, well, I mean, so you definitely had insight into like a, a particularly notable courageous woman's psychology. Were there any other challenges in terms of like, like carrying that out in a character who is, I think it surprises herself with her level of courage in the book? Yeah, I, because I, I think we all we all deal with that, right? Like people, you know, off, like I, I mean, I was in a lot of, you know, violent situations and people say, oh, how courageous and you're fearless. And th it's the opposite is true, right? Every every time somebody shot at me, I was scared. I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you'd have to be nuts not to be scared when somebody's shooting at you or or to, to run into a situation where you could be killed. I mean, when when Cynthia was forming this political party and they, they would send members of state security would follow her and they they'd sit in on the meetings and bug her she knew there was a good chance they were going to kill her. And as a matter of fact, they killed one of her best friends when they were the, the same day they were trying to kill her. And they, they, they kidnapped her brother and tortured him and let her listen on the phone because they were trying to get her to represent the uh, protesters during the Arab Spring. So the, the government had her, had her brother and they broke his jaw, like they tortured him. Um, and so she knew, it's not that she was brave. I mean, that's, that's terrifying. Those are, it's horrible. It's, it's you deciding, what are you going to do? Am I going to stand up for the world that I want to create? Am I going to stand up for, for the, the morality that I, that I believe to be true? Or am I going to capitulate? And, you know, I did it with the force of the U.S. government behind me. You know, I, I, I'd have an air controller next to me who could call in a B-2 to drop a bomb on a sniper position in Afghanistan. She was by herself in her apartment, you know, creating fictions to try to protect her from, from, you know, so the government thought she had more protection than she did. And eventually her time ran out. I mean, that's true courage. So it's, it's not you could say, you know, how much of that is inherent that you're born with this morality or these virtues and how much of it do you through the process of exploration and experimentation learn and come to believe as you get older? I think, you know, I think it's a combination of things. But nobody is born with like without fear, you know, and nobody's born without this. So my character in that book has to come to grips with a lot of things and then decide, is she willing to fight for her own life? Like that, that's one of the fundamental questions of the book and, you know, the underlying fundamental questions. And, you know, I think my career was like that. Other people's careers like that. I think it's, it's just part of human nature. And I think it's a real way to look at people who do courageous things. You have to understand the sacrifice that they're making in their own lives. And they're often risking their own lives to do something they believe is right. Well, I think your character faces a question that's similar to, you know, because I have not had to kind of confront any serious dangers like that. I mean, aside from like one little like scary moment as, as a young teen, but there's always the question in your mind of like, you know, in that in those moments where courage is required, you know, 
would I really like run towards the danger rather than away from it? You know, would I freeze or would I, you know, fight back? And I think it's, it's very easy to kind of tell yourself the reassuring answer, but very hard to know until you face one of those situations. You know, and I think part of that too, like it, I, I think that's true. And I've always said that the difference between like police officers and the rest of the people around them are when somebody starts shooting, the police officers all turn towards the shots when everyone else flees. Right. But I, I don't, I, th- I don't think you're, you're making a judgment on your own character. If you're the person who turns and flees because you're, you're fleeing for your own survival and it, it's instinctual to run from danger and, you know, lots of training and lots of experience in those situations. You can, you know, through that, you can change your own behavior to turn into the, in, to go after the gunman. Right. So that, that's a, that's, that's some, but that's something everyone has that, that fear that they have. And I also think that even if you haven't faced somebody shooting at you, it doesn't mean you haven't been faced with moments that take great courage. I mean, you have a podcast that takes great courage to have a podcast. A lot of people don't understand that when you're putting your own ideas out there, when you're, when you're, you're, you're a writer, you're, you're laying yourself out there for criticism and people love to criticize people who never create anything, love to criticize other people, right? It's very, it's common. And you're willing to take that chance because you believe the ideas that you're talking about and you believe in free speech and you believe in hearing other people's ideas and eliciting the, those ideas and get, bringing them in to the public sphere so we can all talk about them, right? That, that's, that takes courage. And I think people see courage in a lot of ways. It takes courage to have a child and, and, and raise that child. It takes courage to go to work every day to, to take care of your family. You know, all these things take courage. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think that, um, I mean, that's part of why all of us have an interest in stories of kind of direct physical dangers and people confronting them because we all face choices about um you know not necessarily running towards the gunman or running away but we all face the idea of running towards our goal even in the face of great obstacles or not and that's kind of the the universal fact that you know becomes uh kind of crystallized in you know thrillers or mystery novels or things like that I mean, you see it now, right? Like with there, there's a, a huge clash of ideas in, in, in the public square right now. And, you know, you you see everyday parents going to their school boards and standing up and protesting against the teaching of critical race theory, for example. You know, wherever you wherever you stand on that issue, these are people who have been at home just living their lives and now are standing up in public while they're being videotaped and, and speaking about something they feel is a moral wrong. And that, that takes an amazing amounts of courage. And often the, easy, the easiest thing to do is, is turn your head or just go, go along, right? My, my wife could have lived this wonderful life in Egypt, you know, with her family had arist- aristocratic roots and she could have just, you know, lived the, a, a pleasant life, but she did not want to live in that world where she was complicit through her silence. And I think you're seeing that now because things are so politically divisive in this country. You're, you're seeing that a lot. And thrillers, as you mentioned, are a way for people to experience some of this conflict in the most extreme way. And we have this amazing thing in our brains where, you know, when, when I write something and you read it, you're experiencing something that's unique to you. And we're, we're, we're able to imagine things and, and have empathy and put ourselves into, into these positions. So it's a way to do it from the safety of your living room and really get a feel for what it's like. I think that that's amazing. That's what makes stories so exciting for all of us. Yeah, I mean, it's why, like, you know, when you read to children's stories about facing monsters. I mean, that is their training for life, right? It's, it seems like it's just a cute little story, but you realize, no, this is, this is a big part of how they're learning to face danger and negative emotions and prepare for adventure. And that even as adults, we still need that and long for that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's why like the, the structure of the hero's journey you know, the Joseph Campbell structure and mythology that's been such a big part of, of storytelling forever. I think that that's why it's there, because people, you know, the same the same reason, like when you're productive, you're happy. It's because it's instinctual, right? It's it's in your DNA, because if you weren't productive, the human race would just go away. So it makes sense how, how we've developed that through evolution. And the same thing for for happiness or for for standing up for things you believe in for, for basically analyzing life and saying, this is what I believe is, is the way forward. And then following that vision. And when you don't follow that vision, it, 
it, it makes you feel bad about yourself. And it like I, the, the things I regret most in my life are these little things where I didn't stand up to a fear. You know, like I, I remember having to give a, a, a talk when I was when I was a, like a little kid and then someone else said, I'll do it for you. because I was terrified of public speaking, you know, and that, that stuck with me for years that I, w- I was so, I w- you know, because I didn't stand up to the fear. I, I actually had two people. I've, so I've had hundreds of people on Facebook through the Facebook ads I had for my book commenting and it's 99.9% great. But I had like, I had like four people, I think wrote kind of, you know, they didn't like it, a critical uh, thing. And two of them had said the same thing. They said, why would a woman, cause my character Dagny Steele has aquaphobia. And they said, why would a woman with the fear of the water get on a boat? And it, it seemed like it was incomprehensible to them that somebody would confront their fears you know, and there's even a moment in the book where, where Dagny's talking to a friend right at the beginning saying, my husband's asking me on this trip. And she's like, well, you, you, you're afraid of the water. Why would he do that? He's like, maybe he's, he's playing 3D chess. You know, maybe he's doing this because he knows I'm such a type A personality. I'll, it'll, it'll change my focus from this tragedy that happened to, to trying to overcome this fear. Maybe that's what he's doing or, or maybe he's being competitive. You know, sort of, sort of a question like, what are this guy's motivations throughout the book? But, you know, but that's it. Like the, that's what that's what people who are productive. That's what people who are morally sound. That's what people who have thought about broader ideas and are willing to act on them. That's what makes people happy. And it's when you it's when you back down, whether it's the bully at school or or a, a politician who's trying to go too far or whatever the situation in your own life. When when you know something is right and you don't do it because you're afraid that that damages your soul. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Well, you touched on something that why don't we end with this? Because a, a lot of the people who listen to this podcast are writers or, or, or want to be writers. And, you know, one of the things, particularly people who have not published a novel don't realize is usually their model is something like this. I write a novel, I give it to a publisher, and then they go out and sell it. And <laughs> what they don't realize is if you're able to get a publisher, which is very hard, um, they will not, they expect you to market it. And indeed, a lot of getting a publisher is, hey, prove to me that you already have an audience. And so, what has been your experience in learning how to f- discover readers for your novel? I spent a lot of time trying to learn the business. You know, I, 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 I hadn't done it before, even though I'd been a writer all my life, I, I hadn't done this type of writing before. So every day I listened to podcasts, I read dozens, probably 40 books on writing craft. So, you know, my, my, my first advice to the writers is learn the craft because if the story is good and it's well-written, it, I think eventually you'll find an audience, but the industry's changed so much. You know, the big five publishers have, have, have had a real stranglehold until the internet, and now, you know, it's a, you, you, there's, there's smaller publishers are taking a slightly bigger and bigger share every year of the, of the overall books that are sold. But there's a tremendous number of books. I, I think the number is like 2.5 million ISBNs, which is the number assigned to, to printed work every year, come out. And the, about 300,000 of those are traditionally published books, meaning through a, a publisher that offers editing and and is not a is not a like a vanity press where you're paying them to publish it, and then the rest are self published or the, these other hybrid models. So there's there's a lot of noise out there, and the big five really make all their money. Like I, I was listening to the, the CEO of Penguin the other day, and he was talking about how they fifty percent of their of their uh, authors don't earn out their advance, the money that they're given, you know, at the beginning, which I think the average has been about fifteen thousand. It might be a little lower than that now, but they don't even earn it out. And the New York Times recently read an article where they said ninety eight percent of all traditionally published authors. So these are not authors who are self publishing or, or but traditionally published authors ninety eight percent sell less than five thousand copies a lifetime. It's a yeah. stunning figure, right? So if you're, you know, James Patterson or Stephen King, or if you're one of the big names that they know has the platform and people will buy the book because they know the author, you're in good shape. If you're a newer author, it's much, much harder to find that audience. So you ha- even, even if you're with a big five or a smaller publisher or self-published, you still have to go out there and find your audience. So I found Facebook ads have been um, pretty good. Like I've, I've had, a, I've had a lot of positive response from my Facebook ads and I could watch my Amazon ranking go up and down when I pulled ads and then, you know, increase them. So I know it, I know it has an effect. Um, 
I, I would I would urge people like writers to get involved with writing conferences, uh, international thriller writers for for my genre, you know, is, is probably the, the best uh, organization. They're just fantastic and very supportive of writers. And they have conferences and you can interact with these best selling authors and learn a lot about the craft, but also about the business. You have to you have to you can call yourself an artist, but you also have to understand the business because you can create great art. But if it sits in your drawer, no one's ever going to read it. So you, you have to make the effort to get it out in front of people. And there, 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 I mean, there's classes and there, there's, there's, there's so many books written about this, but in the end, it's, it's going to take a significant portion of your time leading up to a book launch. And then after the book launch to get it into people's hands. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, good luck with yours. I'm really, uh, it, it's, it's nice to discover new authors and uh, new books. So I encourage everybody to buy Furious. I'm, I'm really looking forward to your nonfiction book now. I, I hope that that moves speedily through the book universe. Nothing moves speedily through the book universe, but I think the average is one and a half to two years for traditionally published books. But I'm hoping yeah. we find a publisher in the next few months. And I'd ask if, if your readers are interested, go to jeffreyjameshiggins.com and you can see the book, The Unseen, that's another novel I have coming out in August and Furious. And I have a short story up there and a bunch of my essays as well and, and other short stories and other writing. Well, Jeffrey, thanks for giving us some of your time. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.